This is not a lecture, uh, but just a discussion uh, uh, among ourselves uh, on a very important topic, which is truth and justice uh, in a, uh, a recovering country that saw horrors that, as I said to the, uh, one of the tribunal panels, uh, beyond description. There's, no, there's nothing in the English language or any language in the world that can describe the horrors that took place uh, in West Africa. So let's see what we're going to do today here. I always put this slide up to make sure I know what I'm doing. It's more for me than you. All right, well, what we'll do is we'll first talk a little bit about the history of the, of the conflict because it doesn't make sense talking about truth commissions and uh, post-conflict uh, uh, resolution unless you understand what really took place. So we'll briefly talk about that. And it's really, frankly, the real blood diamond story. And if you're here next week, I will be uh, speaking uh, with one of your student groups uh, re dealing with diamonds, guns, and thugs and go into it in a little bit more detail. Uh, but certainly we will skirt that because it really is the blood diamond story. I can't get past the blood diamonds or the story without talking about blood diamonds. All right? Uh, and then what we'll talk about is uh, justice. In the movie, it kind of ends sadly, doesn't it? Looks like the bad guys are going to win. Uh, trust me on this. We won. The good guys win this one. And we wrapped up all of the bad guys, those who bore the greatest responsibility for war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, and uh, properly and fairly and openly prosecuted them, and they were all found guilty as charged. Uh, and the last one, President Charles Taylor, who I indicted in March of 2003, his trial just ended last week. So again, uh, uh, I think, as we say, we got them. Truth plus justice equals sustainable peace. Let me say it one more time. Truth plus justice equals sustainable peace. And if you think about it, if one of those components are missing in a recovering, destroyed country, that peace may not be sustainable, okay? Because there's going to be the ripples of something. Uh, when I was walking the countryside in the outreach program, which I started in September of 2002, uh, victims would come up to me uh, afterwards. I would stand in front of them for sometimes hours just talking to them about what took place in this place, Pujahun, Kailahun, Port Loco, wherever it may have been, uh, and they would tell me. And at the end, someone would come up to me, many of them missing limbs from ears, lips, nose, mouth, buttocks, breasts, hands, legs, what have you. Uh, and they would come up to me, and I'm, I'm going to touch you, but the, they'd say, thank you for coming, and they I mean, literally try to get my attention, and they say, I want to tell you what happened to me. Now, an International War Crimes Tribunal, uh, that's me giving a, an opening statement uh, against the Civil Defense Force, uh, can't prosecute everything. I can't prosecute every single tragedy that took place. That's, that's tens of thousands, and so you representationally charge gra grave crimes, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But that, that man whose wife was raped and cut to pieces in front of him and all four of his children were killed in front of him uh, wants to talk about what happened. He wants to honor them by letting somebody know that what happened to my family happened here. And so that's also justice and that's also truth. And that's why I was with my good friend Bishop Joseph Humphrey. Can you see that, by the way? Do we, er, is lighting going to be a problem? Okay, we have to leave it like this. Can we reverse it? Or it has to stay on like that? Okay. Uh, but my good friend Bishop Joseph Humphrey, chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I worked very closely together, which is kind of an unusual thing. Sometimes that justice-truth thing doesn't quite mix as well as we would like. But here in Sierra Leone, it actually worked because we both worked hard at making it work. Okay. But, you know, this gentleman who has been destroyed, uh, in some ways, the lucky ones in Sierra Leone died. I mean, this man has to carry this burden now for the rest of his life. He wants justice. Uh, he understands after talking to him in front of his peers and his, his village that I can't prosecute the man who actually did that to his family or the group of individuals. Sadly, most of them were about 12, because this is the child's story, soldier story as well. Uh, so he understands I'm not going to prosecute them, but he understands I'm going to prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility that created the conditions by which these individuals, these children, were hacking their way across Sierra Leone. But he also wants the truth to come out. He, wants, he does want to tell his story. 
And so I would encourage him to go to the Truth Commission, which would visit all the villages and towns, taking testimony from the people of Sierra Leone. And so this gentleman did tell that story. So somewhere in the record, his family is recorded. Because in my mind, one of the greatest atrocities in the world is that something happens to a people and nobody does anything and their deaths and their lives go unrecorded. And it's as if they never existed. And that's, and that to me is an atrocity. So you see where I'm coming from when I say truth plus justice equals a sustainable peace? Because what we want these societies to do then is to build their confidence in structure, governmental structure, but also the rule of law. Because in most instances, the rule of law did not exist or the, rule, the law was used against them. Well, let's talk a little bit about the conflict in Sierra Leone. I know that some of you are Americans and you're not your place in the world as far as you don't know where most things are in the world. I know that our international colleagues know probably where West Africa is in Sierra Leone, but that's Sierra Leone and it's in West Africa. And I don't want to insult your intelligence, uh, but I have found that uh, uh, that's always a challenge sometimes when we're dealing with uh, uh, American students because we don't teach geography in the United States very much anymore. So you know, they know where Canada is and they probably know where Mexico is and then after that it, it gets a little dark. Okay, so just want to make sure. Uh, I knew this was going to be a problem when I had just been appointed by Kofi Annan uh, to be the chief prosecutor, and a senior member of the federal government called me and said, Congratulations, you're going to love the Caribbean. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure I will. <laughs> Which is not, not, not an untrue statement. I'm sure I will enjoy the Caribbean someday, comma, but I'm not going there. But I didn't insult him. All right. This was a horror. This was something you knew nothing about. Uh, the Blood Diamond movie, which I think, which I can't watch, but the Blood Diamond movie at least allowed Americans to understand what had happened in West Africa for 10 years we had a horror story that, frankly, is beyond description. Over 1.2 million human beings were murdered, raped, maimed, and mutilated. All right. This also was a very unusual conflict. And I know that many of you study conflict and why conflict start and what happens after a conflict. But when you think about conflict, wars and conflict are started mainly for economic and political reasons and religious reasons. This was a joint criminal enterprise, and I'll show you that in a minute. This was created by criminals for their own personal criminal gain. And the fundamental basis for it, it wasn't the complete basis, but the fundamental basis of this were diamonds. All right, and this is the blood diamond story, which we'll get into in a minute. But again, it was a horror story. I've, I've been around the world. I'd been in 30 years of federal government. I'd been a former paratrooper, special operations officer, guys kicking doors in, those kind of things, defending their country. So I've seen a lot. I was much younger then, by the way. Uh, but I've never seen anything like this. I mean, speechless. You know, I was standing in a mass grave uh, up to my knees, literally in bones, many of them children. Uh, I realized that these people needed justice and these people needed the truth being told, okay? Because they're never going to be able to say anything, right? Okay? So again, I don't want to be dramatic. I can't make this stuff, I could never make this stuff up. But you, and I'm not going to sit here and, and, and make you, I'm not going to go into the gag factor, but I just want to, you do have to know a little bit about the dust around this as we talk this morning or it's just going to be sterile to you. Because when I mention 1.2 million human beings to you, that's a number. What does that mean? All right? But it's one person at a time. Okay? And uh, so that's why I, I, I step aside sometimes and tell you something that is, not, is pretty grim. But I think I do it just to illustrate the point, not to be dramatic. Okay? All right. How are we doing so far? All right? Any questions, thoughts, perspectives? Okay. Oh, I put this, and I'll move slowly. 
But I put this here. This is Samuel Balkery. This is the number two guy behind, or the number three guy behind Charles Taylor, president of, of uh, Liberia, uh, and Fodi Sanko, who was the head of the Revolutionary United Front. Now, there were three main groups in Sierra Leone. There was the Revolutionary United Front, which started the Civil War. Uh, we also had, later on in the conflict, uh, a group of crazy people called the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, which were ratcheted up the horror by a factor of 100 back in 1996-97. The reactive force, the Civil Defense Force, which was kind of like part of the Sierra Leonean Army and hunting societies, were actually defending themselves against the RUF and the FRC. Well, that sounds okay. That sounds like the, the proper thing to do. The problem is, is that they jumped into the swamp with them and they were doing the same thing. So what happened is, is the people of Sierra Leone were whipsawed between quasi-government forces and rebels. You could never be right. Because if you get caught by one and you were supporting the other, you were destroyed and vice versa. So over 2.5 million Sierra Leoneans were displaced, internally displaced. What is internally displaced? Yes, ma'am. Right. It's like all of Syracuse University, or all of Syracuse is burning behind you as you flee north on I-81. And you're the survivors of your families, your units, your organizations, what have you, and behind you is just a burning city. That's an internally displaced human being, to put it more graphically, but you are technically correct. You with me on that? So when I say 2.5 million human beings internally displaced, that seems kind of benign to me, doesn't it? Okay, they lived. Well, you know, like I said, in some instances, the lucky ones died. If you lost your entire family, your entire village, your entire way of life, and now you are fleeing for your life, and you're, and you're heading towards government forces who aren't sure what you are and will kill you just because they think you're a rebel. See how this all of a sudden becomes very real back and forth? You can't go anywhere. And that made a very difficult situation even worse. But this is Samuel Balkery, known as the Mosquito. And all these boy generals and uh, thugs and criminals li like to give themselves these cool names. Rambo, Superfly, and Mosquito, you know, I mean, all of that, Batman. In fact, in child soldiers, they did that. Uh, they would take them from their families after the children killed their parents and then they would give them new names and they would strip them of their childhood for periods of years. But this is the number three guy. Uh, he went to work for Charles Taylor and he was, I knew where he went because I had an information, criminal information system all over West Africa telling me where all of these bad guys are. Uh, maybe in the United States we might call that a espionage or a spy system. So I had people, I'd penetrated the inner circle of Charles Taylor, the president of Nigeria, the president of Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Ghana, and others, where people were telling me what's going on in those countries related to those individuals who bear the greatest responsibility. So I knew where he was. And so one day I told the world that Charles Taylor is, in fact, harboring Samuel the Mosquito Bakri. In fact, I told him exactly where he was, which is where he was. Well, Charles Taylor got mad. I hadn't, I'd indicted Charles Taylor, but I had sealed the indictment. And so Charles Taylor denied it. Then he said, well, yes, he is here. Uh, and uh, then two days later, after I continued the public pressure on him uh, through news conferences and news releases, he said, we found him. Uh, he resisted arrest, and he's dead. And then Charles Taylor mailed Samuel Balkery to me on my birthday in a box. I'll never forget that, watching him slide that cardboard box out of the back of the UN helicopter, saying, you want him? Here he is. And we subsequently learned as we took down Charles Taylor and moved into Liberia and were, were basically t turning his white dove plantation into a crime scene, uh, we found out that he had also killed Samuel Blockery's wife and his three children and his mother-in-law. 
what he was doing was, and one of the reasons why I sealed the indictment of Charles Taylor, and we'll talk about that in a couple seconds, is to make sure that Charles Taylor didn't start a killing spree, killing all my witnesses. You know, life is cheap over there. Life is wonderful. These are beautiful, wonderful people. Uh, but, you know, life is pretty cheap over there if there is an intent to destroy you. So, anyway, Samuel Bakery uh, was a bad guy, and he's illustrative of the types of individuals who bore the greatest responsibility for war crimes and crimes against humanity, centered around this one individual right here, the sitting president of Liberia, Charles Ganke Taylor. So, are you with me so far? Civil War, 1990s, three combatant groups, uh, lots of bad guys moving about, all for the purpose of taking diamonds to use them to uh, turn into cash so they could sustain the particular re rebellion. And this, and I'll show this to you in a minute, was also a larger part, or a smaller part of a larger uh, strategic plan by Muammar Gaddafi to take over West Africa by placing his surrogates in various countries. He did it in Burkina Faso with Blaise Campori. Uh, he'd done it with Charles Taylor in Liberia. He was doing it in Sierra Leone uh, with Fodi Sanko, and he had just started with Samuel Balkri as the lead to take over Cote d'Ivoire and Laurent Bagbo, because these individuals were not in Muammar Gaddafi's uh, pocket. So if you consider the last f six years, seven years of West Africa, all of this has been, we brought this to a halt, uh, this geopolitical plan. We not only broke up a diamond scheme that was worth almost a billion dollars, but we also broke up Muammar Gaddafi's plan to take over West Africa and to take all those diamonds and use them for his own individual criminal gain. Blood diamonds. A common mineral. A mineral that is mined frequently and often and is worth a tenth of the value that you're paying for it. The diamond industry takes all of that, those minerals, that common mineral, puts it in a vault in London to the tune of over $4.5 billion worth of gems, and then parcels the diamonds out. And you're probably thinking, well, why would anybody buy a diamond? Because it's cultural. You're married, right? No. I'm not? Okay, I look down. No, it looks like it. Okay, well, I hope you do someday. Yeah. <laughs> Not to embarrass you, and it's not my intent, but someday, a nice looking gentleman will give you, fall on his, get on his knee and open up a beautiful box. And I'll guarantee you what's going to be in there. A diamond. Well, you might have, after taking this, said, okay, you know, you understand. But if, let's say, for example, you and your fiance had discussed this, and we don't want a diamond, give me a sapphire. I know you still love me. So you go home to show your mom, and she's going to go, what? <laughs> Where's the diamond, right? So I'm, I, again, I'm not belittling uh, our ladies here, but the point is, is that this is a hundred-year-old cultural marketing plan that is ingrained in the American psyche. Seventy-five percent of all gem-quality diamonds are purchased in the United States followed quickly by Japan, all right, and then it breaks down. But it is a lot of diamonds. When I went over there in 2002, 30% of all diamonds on the market were blood diamonds. Now, blood diamonds, when you say blood diamonds, they are diamonds that are manufactured, used to sustain unrest, just like in Sierra Leone. Okay, that's why they call it blood diamonds. There's no physically blood on them. But they cause the deaths of human beings because you purchase AK-47s and other type of weapon systems uh, from the cash that you get from selling a diamonds. And they suck all those diamonds up into the market and move it to the United States after it's cut. Now, the Kimberley process, as a result of the revelations of not just what we were doing in West Africa, but other individuals and various non-governmental organizations uh, had been calling the world's attention to blood diamonds. The diamond you may have on your finger may have killed somebody. Okay? Not, not your diamond, of course. So, the diamond industry, which is very good at sensing public relations, saw this coming down the hill. So what they created was the Kimberley process. 
We said, we will certify every diamond that you purchase, read that in the United States, that it's not a blood diamond. All right, so when it's mined and each diamond is given, put in a bag and it's sealed and it's traced, there's an actual record of it going all the way to Jared's. He went, he went to Jared's. <laughs> well, you know, when I was back at uh, uh, a rare instance of going back to the United States, I, went, I was out shopping with my wonderful wife, and uh, I just got bored and wandered into a jewelry store, let's just say that. Nothing wrong with Jared's. Actually, nothing wrong with diamonds, all I'm just saying. It'd just be a, an aware consumer. So I just was looking, and they said, may I help you, sir? I said, yeah, that's a beautiful diamond. Uh, can I see the Kimberly certificate on that? It's like she pushed a red button. Like, a manager comes out, you know, it's like I'm kind of backing away. Uh, I said, look, I'm just aware that now diamonds should have a Kimberly certificate, and I was just wondering whether you, uh, you know, and he, he kind of hum a hum it and tap danced. So when you go in to, gentlemen, because this is how it works, or if you go in with your fiance and you pick your diamond out, honestly, this is no kidding. Ask them for the Kimberly certificate. If you have it, it's not perfect, but it has decreased the volume of blood diamonds uh, significantly. All right, so it's down to below 10%. Just pay. Hey, so you're, at least you have some sense that this isn't a blood diamond. Now, what we saw in Sierra Leone is. They enslaved people to manufacture those diamonds. So it wasn't just blood diamonds in the sense of trading diamonds for cash to create to buy guns. <clears throat> but in Sierra Leone, they're alluvial diamonds. South Africa, you've got to dig like two miles down to get them. Or in Sierra Leone, they re leach to the surface. You dig three feet and you're in diamonds. And particularly the eastern portion of Sierra Leone, alluvial diamonds in the Kailahun region of Sierra Leone. So when the Civil War was going on, they would enslave people. This, we charged these guys for the first time since Nuremberg, uh, the crime against humanity called enslavement. They literally chained human beings to the pits, fed them enough to raise the ax and drop it down. They usually lasted a week to a month. They would drop dead, literally chained to their pit. They would throw them in a place called Savage Waters to the tunes of thousands of them. And uh, uh, fortunately, we had to drain the pool. And that was a horror story beyond imagination. But the point is, is that we're human beings of all races, ages, chained to pits, uh, mining diamonds, which were put on the market. That's wrong. But that's how it was happening. So that was kind of blood diamonds on steroids, because it was more than just the trading aspect of blood diamonds, but it was the actual physical mining itself, how they brought those diamonds out in a very horrific situation. So still a concern in some ways, about 10 percent, 5 percent. Diamond industry says 4 percent. Uh, it's getting better. But again, be aware, be a aware consumer. Okay, just ask the right questions. Nothing wrong with diamonds, but just be aware that ask for the Kimberly certificate. At least you have a, a feeling that you didn't, you're not wearing something that destroyed a human being in some ways. So this is the West African Joint Criminal Enterprise. You're thinking, oh my God. No, this is actually the case I used to prove those who bore the greatest responsibility, which was my mandate for war crimes and crimes against humanity. This is connecting the dots. This actually is, for real, the blood diamond story. This is how it laid out. Now, what you have here, and again, bear with me, but this is Sierra Leone, right here. 500,000 uh, dead, murdered, raped, maimed, various players. But then you start peeling the onion back. You've got Charles Taylor. You've got uh, Blaise Campori, president of Burkina Faso. You've got Muammar Gaddafi here. You've got various gun runners, diamond dealers, international mafias, Russian, uh, Ukrainian mafia, and you have terrorists involved. And they're move, they use diamonds to move cash. You know, you can insert a diamond somewhere that's not readily available, and you can walk through the medical de metal detector 
or you can do this, you know. They can't pick up the diamonds. So terrorists and various other types of uh, international criminals use diamonds to move $10 million, all right? And they put them in various human beings, usually rectally, and they travel about the world. And uh, so you have diamonds, so here are all the players. All right, and then my, my challenge was, is we put this on the board, I remember drawing it at first in August of 2002, saying, who do we got here? So involved in war crimes and crimes against humanity, destroying a country, uh, you have you know, Victor Bout, Vladimir Menin. You, know, you ever see the movie The Lord of War? <coughs> Which is kind of Victor Bout. These guys were flying, these are the ones that brought the weapons in from the Ukraine, Eastern Europe and Russia down to Burkina Faso and they these planes waited the diamonds come from Sierra Leone all right converted to cash cash guns deaths see how that works I bring all the rest of it as these also were all the players as well because diamonds move and then all of those diamonds go this way to Israel which is a major diamond dealer and all right and so a lot of the blood diamonds are going to Israel and Belgium which is the major diamond, cut, diamond cutting regions of the world and then to the USA. So that's when I say blood diamonds 75 percent going to the United States. That's the path it's kind of taking, all right? Yes? I had a question about the connection of the bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. Are you referring to the uh, embassy bombings? Absolutely, 1998. Guess what? As we peeled all of this onion back, and I, this is literally the graphic slide of the destruction of West Africa and by blood diamonds. And all of the individuals who are playing in this, and many of which look very familiar to you, Hamas, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, gun runners, diamond dealers, Vladimir Men and Victor Boot, and heads of state, three of them, and revolutionary types. So these are all the players in a horror story beyond description. We weren't looking for Al-Qaeda. We landed right in the middle. West Al-Qaeda had been and was all over West Africa. All right, I remember telling Bob Mueller, the director of the FBI, here's the evidence. They're here. I'm not looking for terrorists. I'm looking for those individuals who destroyed a country. Uh, he was very gracious, and then he launched two investigations to prove that Al-Qaeda was not in West Africa. They couldn't prove it uh, because they were embarrassed by the fact that they had missed the fact that Al-Qaeda was all over West Africa. Well, Al-Qaeda was those individuals who took down the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. Where did the bad guys go? Monrovia. Why? Because I've got the check-in documents. Room 207, Hilton Hotel. Charles Taylor harbored them for years until things settled down and then they melted back into the system. One of the individuals, Galani, was caught in Pakistan a couple of years ago and has been prosecuted. Okay. So the key for those of you who are studying post-conflict situations and situations where an emerging conflict is ending and you have to figure out who the players are, this is a perfect case study. Look at all of the players here. It's not just the, those who bear the greatest responsibility, who I had the mandate to prosecute for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Look at all these folks. Now, sometimes I had to dance with the devil. In order to prove my case, sometimes I have to work with somebody who's got blood, of, blood's on his, blood on his hands. And so there were some of these individuals who actually worked for me so that I could prove the case. Because if you're go, it's, like a, it's like a mafia case. You know, nobody's going to go down for the big guy. But if you want to prosecute the big guy, you're going to have to turn the inner circle. That's a very delicate type of thing to do. We did. And those individuals testified and took down all of them, and will take down Charles Taylor as well when he's found guilty. 
lots to the story. I, I, I'm just giving you a spoonful of sugar and I have to back away because we've got to get the truth commissions. But I'll take a couple questions and then we'll move on, okay? And then I'll be speaking again on this and the blood, larger horror of this uh, next week. Yes? Oh yeah, absolutely. You, you immediately, when you, of course, this is all, how do you prosecute this? That's another course which we teach over at the law school. Uh, the bottom line is, is that you have a, you've immediately filed for a protective order and everybody has a number. And we have, uh, when a witness comes in to testify, the shades are drawn between the public because it's all bulletproof glass. Uh, the shades are drawn, the witness comes in, he's sitting in a box with his back to the audience. They can hear him, they just can't see him. Now, the defendants, the judges, and the prosecutor can see him because that's part of due process and a fair trial, an open trial. But the public can't. So instead of being Dave Crane, I'm, I'm witness 0617. All right, no one ever sees me and knows my name. Okay? So yeah, you have to be very careful because they'll die. Now, some of these individuals, uh, we had to put in programs that they'll never see the light of day again. I mean, changing names, changing, I mean, everything. Not just the witness, but the spouse, the children, and the immediate family. So sometimes that can be as many as 15 people, which we move about the world. Because if they're found, they die. They die 20 years from now, they die tomorrow. So we have an obligation. It takes a lot of guts to step forward publicly and say, my boss, Charles Taylor, the most powerful warlord in Africa, I used to watch him take the jars of diamonds, convert them to cash. I mean, that's, to a prosecutor, you gotta have that. I've gotta link Charles Taylor and others to this joint criminal enterprise. Okay, well anyway, what did we do? Well, we indicted 13 of those who bore the greatest responsibility for several listed of crimes, among others, and there were about 11 of them, all right? And Charles Taylor. They've all been convicted, their appeals have run out, and they're all serving between uh, 35 to 52 years in international jails around the world, okay? And now you think, my God, they didn't get life for th these horrors? Well, that's the international system. We can talk about that. But you have to understand, unlike other countries, to include the United States, there's no time off for good behavior. There's no parole. Uh, 52 years is 52 years. ISIS Sese, for example, the, the head RUF, individual behind Fodi Sanko got 52 years. He's 35, so do the math. Yeah, at 87 he may still be around, but the point is is that uh, some justice was done on behalf of the Sierra Leonean people. So that's the justice piece, but as importantly, as importantly is truth. I was a great support, yes? I just had a question about sovereignty of the, of the nation and how mm -hmm. the ICC, you know, in your capacity, um, work with the, with the country to um, bring people like those. Well, the, inter the International Criminal Court was created in July of 2002. Any crimes uh, that were perpetrated before 2002, they have no jurisdiction over. So any crimes after 2002, they have cognizance over. Um, there's various ways by which the ICC can gain jurisdiction over it. And that's another story, other than the fact that the ICC can, at the appropriate time, prosecute a corporation. It's just that the law and the facts just haven't arisen. 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 Whatever. There we go. Whatever he said. Okay. TRCs are important. They establish truth. They don't have a great track record. Uh, we had the first one in South Africa. Everybody was enamored. It saved a nation, Nelson Mandela, finding the truth. Uh, everybody said, wow, this is important. We need to do these when we have other types of situations, like in Sierra Leone. Most of them don't do well. They, the, they set the bar too high. They're always thinking South Africa. And in reality, they need to ratchet this down a lot and tailor the mission and the capability to the circumstance. All right. Most TRCs, in fact all TRCs, are domestic institutions created by, in this case, the Lomé Peace Accord, trying to find out what happened, trying to establish the truth. All right. 
And again, we already talked about why that's so important. Truth plus justice equals sustainable peace. Uh, they began their work in 2002, and I was getting ready to go to Sierra Leone in the summer of 2002, the same time the, the then current, or the then director of the TRC said that I was going to build a firewall between the special court and my organization, and I'm not going to work with them. I thought, you know, because they're, they're going to meddle and get in my way, because I actually had the authority and the power to take all of the things that they gather and use it for evidence. And that's a negative, because then people think, if I go to the TRC, then now I could either be indicted or I could, I could be called as a witness or anything I say can and be used against me. So that limits and does not encourage people, right? So what I did was when I, the day I arrived in Sierra Leone, flashing pictures, boosh, 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 I announced that I was going to work closely with the TRC, but I was not going to use any, any evidence given to the TRC as part of my case. And that just took all of the wind out of everybody's sails. And I never did, not one word. And I encouraged the people of Sierra Leone to go and tell their stories. And when I walked the countryside in my town hall programs, I did that, saying, because you know, they would want, I, I, who do I speak to? Why aren't you prosecuting that individual for raping my wife and cutting her to pieces? Of course, you have to, that's a very cathargic moment for everybody. Uh, and you just, you talk through that. Uh, but you say, I'm not prosecuting individuals in this, all, in this room. I'm prosecuting those who created the conditions. But it's, you need to tell your story, and you need to go to the Truth Commission and tell your story. Privately, you could do it in private, or they could do it publicly. All right? And so they did by the tens of thousands. I think that that was good. So we worked closely. I invited Bishop Humper to lunch every, every month. I invited the entire TRC uh, once a quarter for dinner, <coughs> tried to keep the communications open, but I didn't use one word of anything that was used by the TRC in order to allow the TRC to succeed. Let me finish, and then if we have other comments or questions, we can maybe after class, okay? <coughs> uh, but anyway, we were the first situation where there actually was a war crimes tribunal and a truth commission working at the same time. It's never been done before and actually hasn't happened since. But it, it succeeded about 90%. It wasn't perfect, and I'm not saying anything that I did in Sierra Leone was perfect, but we sure tried hard. And the issue was is that we worked together and the Sierra Leonean people had two ways to, to, see, to see their justice done. They could tell their story, they could see those who created the horrible conditions that for the conflict, uh, and at the end of the day, it'll be up to the Sierra Leonean people to judge whether we did it right or not, because it's all about them. So, let me just finish the slide, and then uh, I think the time is moving on. Okay, well, some concluding thoughts. Again, all of this will be on Blackboard, so you can review this. Uh, I'm at the law school. My door is always open. I'll be here next week. I mean, I work, I'm in the Maxwell School faculty, too, so... Anytime you want to invite me over to talk about this on a brown bag or anything like that, uh, I'm pretty easy. Okay? So, bottom line is, is this. And that, by the way, that's Charles Taylor sitting in the dock. Remember the cocky picture of him with his AK-47 saying, I'm a bad dude? He doesn't look so bad right there, does he? Okay. Yeah, it was personal with me. Truth and justice equals sustainable peace. Truth plus justice equals sustainable peace. And with that, I think I'm done. <laughs>